Now, uh, <clears throat> a lot of these things. Yep, good questions. Okay. Yeah, we're going to get on a lot of these here pretty quick. Good. Yeah, it says, uh, can you pray healing for someone addicted to drugs or alcohol? Yes. You will have to cast out spirits involved. Um, but yes, you can. Matter of fact, we have seen uh, praying for people that were absolutely intoxicated, prayed for them, cast out a uh, spirit of alcohol. Yeah, and there's different names. It, it's the name isn't what's important, right? You have to <clears throat> finish one thought before we start the next. Um, while we were praying for them and cast these things out, even though they were drunk a second before, they sobered up instantly and uh, understood what we were talking about and went through. So a lot of that is a spirit, okay? Um, and it does try to affect their mind sometimes. And if it, the longer it goes on, the more it affects the mind. You can always set them free. Uh, but, see that you can give healing or deliverance to people. Now, whether they keep it and whether they walk in it, okay? Now, see, you can't give salvation to a person. You can, you can basically present it, and if they accept it, they walk in it. But you can give healing. Many times in the church, we've been taught that healing and salvation are one and the same. Okay, they are not. Now, they are closely united, but they're not one and the same. If they were one and the same... Jesus wouldn't have had to bear the stripes for our healing and to pour out his blood on the cross for our salvation. But he did each thing separately, so each thing is a separate situation. Now, salvation, I can't give to you. I can present the message and then you decide. Healing, I can give to you. The reason there's a difference is because for you to get healed, it does not require a change in your lifestyle. Okay? For you to get saved, it does. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the difference is, if you want to stay healed, it may require a change in your lifestyle. But since healing is a sign and not a reward, see, a sign happens before. A reward happens after. Right? You reward a person for what they did. You show a sign to get them to do something. Right? That's the difference. Now, what you're going to see, if you're not already seeing a lot in this teaching anyway, <clears throat> is that this will create in you a totally different mindset. Right? Number one, you will develop a mindset that basically says anything is possible. Somebody will say, well, can you pray for... Yep, we can do that. <laughs> you know, it's just... There you go. Uh, <clears throat> it it creates... And, and, the second thing is, there was another question here. And I, I like these questions because it leads us right into some of the teaching. Here it is. Um, yes. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I know there's been a lot of teaching in these areas. And some of these are so specific. <clears throat> and the teaching has been so specific that we have learned more than we've walked in. And because of that, you know more, which causes you to act a certain way. Let me read you the question. When it comes to healing, does a husband have more authority to heal his wife than any other believer would have to heal her? Okay, now that's, that's a good question because of the teaching that we have about the authority in the, of the husband over the wife and the different thing and all that. Right? So it's a good question. Now, <clears throat> the, the answer is very simple. Technically, nobody has more or less authority. Okay? Bottom line is, and again, boy, we are jumping right over and going right to the, like the Saturday afternoon sessions is normally, okay? <clears throat> authority is very simple. First off, you don't have any, okay? I know that's totally opposite of what you've been taught, but let me explain before you panic, okay? Now, <clears throat> first off, all authority is, is pre-permission, right? That's all it is. If you have authority in a situation... Someone has given you pre-permission to handle everything up to that point of authority. Right? So authority is just pre-permission to do something. If I say, um, you know, we, if I ask you, take my car down and grab me something to drink. Well, then you have authority to take my car to the nearest store, get something to drink, and bring it back. Now, if you go beyond that, now you've stole my car. 
Right? Because I gave you authority to go to the store, not to go to the next state. Right? So, pre -per uh, authority is just pre-permission. Now, this is, to me, this is one of the main things that has helped me minister like we do all over the world and see the same results no matter what. Now, <clears throat> in go to go to Matthew chapter eight real quick. Matthew chapter eight, because this kind of just uh, you know cuts to the quick, so to speak, and gets it done. Now <clears throat> he says here. In, uh, just actually, go back a couple of verses before 8. Boy, where do we want to start? We could go back to Matthew 5. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's all good, and it all applies, you know? It's just amazing. But you know the story here. If you, go, if you look even at the end of Matthew 7, the thing that stood out about Jesus was this. In... <clears throat> Verse 28, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, so apparently these sayings had such an impact on the people that this is how they responded. The people were astonished at his doctrine. So you go back and read what he had just said. Actually, he said all three chapters there, and you read. But what stood out about it, and we're not going to read all three chapters right now, okay, so we're not going to do that. But it said, verse 29 tells what stood out about it, because it said, For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Okay? So what, what the difference between and what made them astonished at Jesus' teaching and the difference between Jesus' teaching and the scribes, apparently, and one place even says the scribes and the Pharisees, was that when Jesus said something, he didn't, he didn't give any room for compromise or for debate. He just said, this is the way it is. And then they would say, well, who are you to say that? And he said, well, they'd say, where did, where did you get your authority? Who, who gave you authority to say this? And he said, well, let me ask you, where did John get his authority? Was it from heaven or was it from men? And so he immediately goes into his position. Now, <clears throat> when it said here that he didn't teach like them, it means that the scribes and the Pharisees, they would read all these different rabbis. And every rabbi would have a different commentary on on the law. And they would read them and they'd say, well now, here's the scripture and here is what Rabbi so-and-so says. Now, that's pretty good and, and I can see that, but you know, uh, Rabbi such-and-such, -such, now he says this instead. And I can see that too. You see, what it was is authority doesn't question. I'm possibly expecting an emergency phone call. That's why I'm checking my phone. I keep it on. It's on 24-7. And if I get it, then we're going to take a break. All right? So, because, very honestly, you can wait and they can't. Okay? So, uh, you know, bear with me. Don't mean to sound disrespectful to you, but people dying is more important than you hanging on the next word. Okay? So, um, that's why I keep checking my number, uh, my, my telephone. <clears throat> now, in Matthew 8, at the end of Matthew 7, that's what they said about him, that he taught as one that had authority. In other words, when you speak with authority, you don't end your statements with a question mark. Okay? And you don't end it with, well, what do you think? You state it. This is, and that's it. the amazing thing about Jesus' teaching, when he stated his teaching, he always ended up saying things like, well, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. Isn't that right? And then when he said, but I say unto you, then he would always say, for it is written. Right? So his authority, in speaking what he did, was based on it is written. Right? Well now, here's what he says, when because the reason I bring this up is because we're talking about authority, and it's brought up a lot right here in Matthew 8. He says, and I'm going to go down to verse, da -da -da, where do we go? Well, let's go to verse 5. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Now the centurion didn't ask him to come and heal him. He just stated the problem. And Jesus, now notice this, Jesus jumped at the chance to heal somebody. 
Right? Just knew the situation and said, I'll come and heal him. He was willing to go there. Now, you think Jesus didn't know what power he had? I mean, because how did he end up healing the guy? Healing the servant. Speaking a word, right? But he was willing to go. Why? Because, and this was what's amazing, when you operate in power, you know you can speak. You, you know the possibility. It's almost like quantum physics. I, I, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff going on right now in the... Um, in science world about quantum physics and a lot of new developments are taking place and all it is is they are learning new ways to express statements of faith right because quantum physics is nothing but scientific faith talk that's all it is and when you start studying it it is fascinating to realize as a matter of fact when I was in Indonesia or actually it was Malaysia I was talking with a young man who is majoring in quantum physics and I understood about a third of what he said, but what I got out of it was really interesting. And he started talking to me about the duality theory that basically says, according to quantum physics, in the duality theory, which is generally becoming the accepted theory right now, is that almost like parallel universes in the sense that whatever happens in one automatically happens in the other. It's like cause and effect. Okay? Now, to think that way, really you have to think biblical. Because Jesus said, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Right? Now, notice where the binding starts. It doesn't start in heaven. Binding starts here. Right? You're going to realize the true authority you actually have. Hopefully by the time we get done. If not, if you'll continue delving into this, you will get it. He said, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Now, basically what it says is, whatever you permit on earth will be permitted by heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbid, forbidden by heaven. Basically, he said, it would be like, and when he explained it like this, I got it. Because the illustration he used was two pool tables. All right? So when he used pool tables... I could relate, all right? And he said it'd be like having two pool tables perfectly set up <clears throat> with the, the balls racked and everything ready to go. And a shooter on one table and no shooter on the other table. But when the shooter hits the balls, whatever happens with the cue ball hitting the rack of balls, whatever happens... At the exact same moment, the same thing happens on the second table with nobody shooting. Now think about that. Because when you start looking at the spirit realm, and you start looking at cause and effect, and what happens where, and we already see that man's authority is essentially over the earth. We see that from Genesis 1, 26 and 28. And then... And I don't know if you realize it or not, but whenever God, in Genesis 1.26, whenever God created man, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, let him have dominion over the earth, subdue it, right? <clears throat> Later on, I think it's what, chapter 2, chapter 3, right there, it says, God made all the beasts of the field, and then it said, God caused all the animals to come before Adam to see what Adam would call them. Right? Why did God have to see what Adam would call him? Because God had already put Adam in dominion over the earth. You understand? That's how much authority, how much dominion God gave Adam. Which is why Satan wanted Adam. Because he knew if he got Adam, then every, if Adam bowed his knee to Satan, then everything under Adam, the earth and everything on it, would automatically bow its knee to Satan. Right? And hence, the curse would come upon because of following Satan. And we see that. Now, a whole lot more goes into this, but it's fascinating stuff. Sooner or later, I hope to get a chance to talk on it other than, uh, you know, in the DHT and little snippets. <clears throat> but I've been down in, uh, I can't remember what it's called now. Ah, it's in uh, Texas, Granville, somewhere through there. No, not Granville. Anyway, it's uh, Dr. Carl Ball's Creation Research Institute there. And... Uh, I've seen his experiments with animals under different light and he changed the light to what the light would have been like before the flood and you put a venomous like a viper he actually put I think it was a viper 
in an aquarium, put a different color light, which would have been like the sunlight, and over a period of hours, the venom in the viper turned non-venomous and it became docile and you could pet it. All right? Because of the atmosphere and the, the, the light that was coming on the earth. Now, after the, and the Bible says that whenever the floods came, the canopy of the heavens came down and light changed. The closest we see to it is at sunset and sunrise when you see the pink in the sky. That's the way it was. And, but you can only see it at a distance because of how it cuts through uh, crosswise, cross-section through the atmosphere. And <clears throat> they've done all kinds of other experiments along the same lines and I can go into some detail, but it's just fascinating to see how it works. But anyway, going into that, is that that's how we can understand that even though we're here, the Bible says we are seated with Him in heavenly places. All right? Through understanding string theory and quantum physics, you can understand being here and being there at the same time. And what you say here echoes there. You understand? That's why what you bind here is bound there. Because when you say it here, it's like you standing up in heaven and going, this is the way it'll be. And heaven going, okay, we agree. Why? Because you're speaking the words of the one you represent, not your own words. Now, you don't have to say it in King James to say the words of the one you represent. What's supposed to happen is, your will is supposed to be so entwined with his will that you can't tell the difference and neither can any other spirit being between when you speak and when Jesus speaks. Alright? He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Not two. He said, he tried to explain that and said, Paul said, listen, I'm going to give you a mystery. I'm going to explain it to you. He said, you have to understand marriage that two people can become one. Well, Two people don't become one physically, right? They're two, two physical separate beings. But they become one in unity, direction, purpose, ambition, goals, desires. And if you live with them long enough, you can even finish their sentences. Isn't that right? Because you become one. You can think what they think, right? Now, if you walk with Jesus according to Scripture, you can think what He thinks. Matter of fact, your mind, let me say it the correct way, his mind must become your mind. This whole thing about, well, you know, his thoughts above our thoughts. Okay, that's a lie. Okay, now, when it was said in the Old Testament, that was true. Because they didn't have the Spirit of God. They didn't have the mind of Christ. But that's not you. You have the Spirit of God, you have the mind of Christ. Because of that, you can think his thoughts, speak his words, and do his deeds. Amen? Now, <clears throat> give me, let me give you a real quick, and we're going to get into Matthew 8. I hadn't forgotten that. This, okay. <clears throat> I, I do this for a living. I'm a professional. All right? So I know what I'm doing. Doesn't always look like it. Okay? <laughs> but, now, <clears throat> in, you might want to write these down. These are things you need to remember. Number one, when a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees. Hell hears and obeys. All right? Now you need to get that mentality. When a child of God speaks, heaven hears and agrees. Hell hears and obeys. Now, to get that mentality, you need to know these three things, and you need to say these. You need to emphasize them to yourself. And just being very honest with you, God has no question about who you are. Okay? He knows who you are. The devil has no question about who you are. You are the only person that has a question about who you are. Right? Right? God knows and hopes you'll find out. The devil knows and hopes you don't find out. Right? You're the one that decides whether you find out or not. Real simple. Now, so, so you need to get these three, these three things in order. Number one, you should say this every day. You say, I am God's son. Now, even if you're female, you're God's son. You understand? 
So don't, don't separate yourself from Christ and say, but I'm not God's son, I'm his daughter. Okay? We understand you're female here. But as far as God is concerned, according to Galatians, there is neither male nor female. Right? So where God has not made a distinction, don't you make a distinction. Right? You've been fighting for equal rights all these years. <laughs> don't blow it now. Okay? Agree. Okay? <laughs> now, <clears throat> next... So first off, I am God's son. Number two, I am the devil's master. Right? Number three, I am man's servant. So, number one, two, and three, I am God's son, I am the devil's master, and I am man's servant. Now, until... The Bible says to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you would be great, he that would be great among you must be servant of all, right? So our job, and, and again, there's some things that we're going to have to change as we say them. It hadn't happened here, so it's been good. I can say this without making anybody feel bad. <clears throat> Many times when people introduce me, they'll say, let's welcome the servant of God, okay? And I understand what they mean. But understand this. I'm not God's servant. I'm God's son. I'm a son who serves. You understand? I'm not saying I don't serve God. I do serve God. But I'm not a servant. It's a big difference between a son who serves and a servant. Okay? That's what you've got to get the understanding this week. Old Testament saints were servants. New Testament saints are sons. Old Testament saints... According to Jesus, the servant doesn't know what his master does. So, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts above our thoughts. We can't think his thoughts, right? According to the Old Testament, according to, to being a servant. But Jesus said, and remember, he was, he was not dead yet. Right? He was still alive when he spoke this. He said, I don't call, he said, the servant doesn't know what his master does. Henceforth, I call you not servants, but friends. Now, you say, but why didn't he call them sons? Because his blood hadn't been poured out. He couldn't call him a son. So the closest he could get without lying is a friend. You understand? And what that means is this. A servant has to be told what to do, when to do, how to do it. He's a slave. He's a servant. A son knows his father's business. You know what Jesus said? Don't you? Why would you go seeking for me? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Right? Why? Because the son knows the father's business. A servant doesn't know what his master does, but a son knows. Right? Jesus said, I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me, the will of my father. We're going to look at that here a little bit later on, actually probably tomorrow. But you need to realize that to be, to be man's servant, let's say man is sick, um, demon-possessed, okay? To serve him is not to do it through natural means. Now, I'm not saying if they're feeling bad, you shouldn't check, take them chicken soup. But it shouldn't stop there, right? That might get you in the door. But you don't stop there. When Jesus said, and you have to remember, everything Jesus said had to be taken into account over everything else he said. In other words, it all has to fit together. You can't take it and piece it together. When he said, whatever you would... Well, first off, let me back up. It's there in Matthew chapter 7. It's what I almost went to a while ago and I want to read the whole chapter. But he said, Strive to enter into the straight, to the narrow gate. Right? He said, because broad is the way that leads to destruction. Right? And narrow is the way that leads to life. And then he said, Many try to find the way into life, but few there be that actually find it. Then, now we always think that means finding Jesus. He never referred to himself that way. That's church talk. Okay? He wasn't talking about himself. He tells you what he's talking about. He said this. He said, <clears throat> enter in the straight gate. Don't go in the broad way. The broad way leads to destruction. The straight way, the narrow way leads to life. He said, therefore, in other words, because of what I just told you, whatsoever you would do, or that you would have men do unto you, 
do ye even so to them. So he said, because of what I just taught you about the straight gate and the narrow gate and the broad gate, because of that, then here's, what I, here's how I want you to live. Do to others what you would have done to you. In other words, if you do to others what you would have done to you, that is the narrow gate. You understand? It's right there. You've got to take it in context. You can't pull it out and make it say whatever you want. So the narrow gate is doing to others what you would have done to you. Now, but you have to remember, this is Jesus talking. So when he referred to doing to others as you would have done to you, he wasn't talking like a normal, mortal human. He was talking like a son of God with power. So, if you ask the average human, uh, if you were sick, what would you want done? Well, I would want you to come bring me chicken soup. Or I want you to come take me to the doctor. That's what a normal human would say. So, that's what they would be bound to do because that's what they would want done to them. But as a son or daughter of God, as we'd say, with power, then you look at someone and say, okay, <clears throat> here I am, <clears throat> Spirit of God, power. I look at that person and say, they're sick. If I was them, what would I want someone like me to come do? Come lay hands. Set them free. Heal them, Right? See, we always thought the golden rule was just a nice little way of... Jesus' way of saying, be nice, treat people right. Right? Jesus wasn't real overly concerned with people being nice. Right? I mean, you think about it. Do you realize they didn't refer to Jesus as that nice Jewish rabbi? All right? The first time he turned over their tables in the temple, I and their money went everywhere, and they scattered, okay? I guarantee you they weren't thinking of him as nice. Right? And whenever he was back there and they were watching and saying, isn't that, that that new Jewish rabbi, Jesus, what's he doing? I don't know. looks like he's making a whip. <laughs> well, you know whenever they made that, when he made that whip, and he started chasing them out of there and they were running and they got outside the temple and he's in there. They were running because they were afraid he was going to hit them. Right? You don't run from a man with a whip unless you think he's going to hit you with a whip. <laughs> right? And I guarantee when they got outside the gates, they weren't out there going, <laughs> Ted G, he's such a character, man. We're all running like he was going to hit it. He's such a nice guy, just like that guy. Okay, they weren't saying that at all. They were yelling for the temple guards to come arrest this guy. And I guarantee you, they were peeking through the gates and making sure nobody touched their money. Right? I mean, they left the money there, right? They all ran. So Jesus wasn't some nice guy. He wasn't looked upon as a nice guy. Now, the religious people hated him. And the sinners loved him. Right? Mainly because he helped the sinners and blasted the religious people. I mean, the only people he ever really got on, he never blasted a, a sinner. He never said, oh, you dirty dog, you're going to hell, that's it. He told the religious people, you've got to repent because you're going to hell. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, he said, not only do you not go into the kingdom, but you stand in front of the door and don't let anybody else in either. Right? And the one, you remember whenever he went to his own hometown and said they got mad at him? First off, it says, it's in Luke. Matter of fact, well, we're, we hadn't left uh, 8 yet, so I don't want to get off of there. But in Luke chapter 4, he talks about it. And it says, they all wondered at the gracious words coming from his mouth. And then it turned around and said, do you think that there weren't some righteous people out there? And yet, whenever Elijah came, he only came to, to Naaman the Syrian. In other words, what he was doing, and he blasted all the people that he was saying God only helped or God did not help the Israelites at that time he helped foreigners and they got mad because he was blasting their nationality and said wait a minute we got a covenant with God and that's when they picked him up and led him to the edge of the cliff and we're going to throw him over right and like five verses before they, they marveled at the gracious words proceeding from his mouth you know and the next minute they're ready throw him over a cliff just because he said that they might not be God's chosen people. Imagine that, right? So his idea of nice wasn't what we would think. And so he wasn't trying to tell people just be nice. He was saying, look, this is the standard you should live by. This is a standard you'll be judged by. He said, this is what's going to get you in that narrow gate or out of that narrow gate. You want to walk in the narrow way? This is it. Treat people like you want to be treated. Whatever they need, you give it to them. 
If you were there sick, what would you want somebody to do? Come pray for them. You know, come pray for you. Isn't that right? Come set you free. <clears throat> so, if that's what you would have done to you, then, now see, we think, well, Lord, just lead me. Lord, if you guide me and lead me. No, there's no leading in that. It's your choice. Because if you wait for a leading, and we're going to talk about this more in detail later on when we talk about being led by the Spirit. <clears throat> but if you're supposed to wait to be led and have a feeling of being led, first off, you're walking by feeling, sight, and not by faith. And if you're going to walk by faith, you're going to walk according to the Word of God. But if you're going to wait for a feeling, then there is, and, and the feeling, let's say the feeling is, you feel warm. Alright? Well, don't move to Texas. You'll have a feeling, you'll be led all the time. Alright? Because it's always hot down there, pretty much. Now, that's what I tell people all the time. I say, you know what's amazing? I go in these healing services, and I got half the crowd is there wanting me to lay hands on them so they'll have hot flashes, and the other crowds want me to lay hands on them so they can get rid of them. I, I say, you know, it's amazing how people think. Alright? <clears throat> because you think that if we lay hands, the anointing's going to have some hot, warm feeling come across you. And spirit has no feeling associated with it. Pure, pure spirit. Any feeling you may have is how your soul reacts to it. But it has nothing to do with the anointing. Alright? We'll, again, talk about that later. <clears throat> but I, to, I want you to understand that whenever Jesus said do something, it was a command. A command does not need a leading. A command has within itself its own leading. If it doesn't have a leading associated with it, it's not a command, it's a suggestion. You understand? So, if he said do it, you don't need to feel a thing. You don't need to hear a voice. You don't need to have anything happen. You don't need to have a, a rhema word quickened to you. As I said, that's not what it means anyway, but you don't even need that. You don't need a revelation. You need to be obedient because obedience to the word of God is what you're going to be judged by. Jesus said these words are what's going to judge you. Right? He didn't say how you obey a leading. He said it's how you obey these words. Simple as that. Now, <clears throat> let's go back over this real quick before I send you to another break. Oh, we're doing pretty good. Okay. He says in verse 7, we just read that, And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority. Now, you notice, you know first off that God didn't tell Matthew to put chapter 8, that, you know, those words, chapter 8 there, right? And he didn't tell Matthew to put numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. He, okay, the um, punctuation, the chapter division, and the numbers are not divine, right? There's no, if you look at the original Greek, there's no breaking up of the words between chapters or anything else. So what we're hearing here is Jesus is talking about authority again and it points out how this centurion refers back to authority. Now we read just before that in the last verse of the last of chapter 7 it says that they Jesus spoke as one having authority. So there's a reason Matthew is emphasizing authority. Amen. He says the centurion says, "For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me." And I say to this man, go, and he goes, to another come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So, he's saying, I'm not worthy for you to come to my roof. You just speak the word, and it'll happen. In other words, you give the command, sir, and I understand that you have authority, because I recognize authority. I recognize how your people had just been healed, just before that. He probably saw them being healed. He saw how he spoke. He said, but if you just speak the word, if you just give a command... My servant will be healed because I'm a man under authority. I recognize authority. I know that if I give a command, it'll be obeyed. And I know if you give a command, it'll be obeyed. Now watch this. <clears throat> That's all the man said. Alright? Not a lot of detail. So you can't add anything to it. You can't say there was something there that he knew or something. You know what I'm saying? You just can't add to it. Alright? When Jesus heard it, not when Jesus ha heard from God, but when Jesus heard what the centurion said, he marveled and said to them that followed, not to the centurion, but to the disciples that were with him. Alright? Verily, or truly, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. 
No, not in Israel. Now, he wasn't talking about the country. He was talking about the people who were in covenant with God. Right? He marveled because here is a Roman centurion, not a covenant person, had greater faith than covenant people. All right? And he said, I hadn't found this kind of... What he's, now, you've got to picture this. The Roman centurion comes up, says all this. Jesus marvels. You know, his mouth falls open. He can't believe it. He turns... He's standing there. He just heard this. He turns to his disciples and says, Did you, did you just hear what he said? I, he said, I haven't found this kind of faith in you guys. Isn't that what he's saying? I mean, because they were the children of Israel, right? He said, I haven't found this in you. Matter of fact, he, if you ever notice, if you ever do a study on Peter's life, Peter's life was not a good example. All right? He, he started out good and went downhill. From the beginning. You go through and read Peter's life. What happened? When he first started, healed the sick. Right? Then later on, it was amazing because it said, <clears throat> he called to Jesus. Remember, he's walking, Jesus is walking by on the, on the water. Peter said, hey, if, if it's you, call me. Well, what's Jesus going to say? Oh, it's not me. And Peter kind of put him in a bind, you know, to where he, he said, okay, come. Peter steps out on the water. He did take steps, but then he starts to sink. Isn't that right? So first off, he, they go out, they heal the sick. Great results. Next step, he has some faith, but starts to sink. Then later on, Jesus turns to him and says, Why are you faithless? So Peter went from faith to heal the sick, to watching circumstances and starting to sink, to being faithless. That sounds like kind of the opposite of the direction we want to go, doesn't it? I mean... We, we would rather start faithless and end up great faith healing the sick, right? That wasn't Peter's life. You go through and study it. He had a rough time. And that's why Jesus at the end said, listen, you go tell Peter when he's converted, feed my sheep. Right? And now think about this though. All that happened before he got born again. Alright? Do you realize these guys healed the sick before they were born again? Right? Before they had received the Spirit in Acts 2.4 and all that, or Acts 2. And do you realize that? All that was done while they were still unborn again, natural men. And they were operating under an authority. Now watch, because I'm going to have to send you to break here. Well, we got a little bit more time. <clears throat> but I, I want you to get this thing about authority, because once you understand this, it'll start to change everything. He said, And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham with, and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now watch. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into cast out into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's not a good word. Right? He, now, how would you like... Here you are. You're the chosen people. You're traveling with Jesus. A Roman, right? The enemy of your people. People who have you, as we would call it, an occupying army, is standing there, and Jesus says, man, you got great faith, and turns around to them and says, what's the matter with you guys? I, you ain't even got the faith of this guy that you hate. Isn't that right? He said, here's the, the enemy of our people, and he's got more faith than you do, and then he says, I'm going to tell you what, matter of fact, many are going to come in that day and sit down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children of the kingdom are going to be thrown out. He, who's he talking about? Them. He said, many are going to be cast out, and there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? And then he, he goes on and tells them, look, this is... He, he even told them at a later time. He said, even the, the, the harlots and the publicans are going to get into heaven before you, some of you guys. Isn't that right? And that's why they got so upset. That's, you know, obviously you wouldn't like him either if he started talking to you like that. So, now watch, he goes on. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go your way... And as you have believed, so be it done unto you. Now let me stop something here. We read that, and we read things like, according as you have believed, be it done unto you. Um, or this here, as thou hast believed, so be it. Now, he was not referring to faith. Y'all didn't remind me about faith. Great thing. Remember that? Well, we got there anyway. <clears throat> but he wasn't referring to faith as volume. In other words, how much faith? Could we say, well, according, to you, according as thou hast believed, or go your way as thou hast believed. We read that, or have been taught to see that as, 
to the degree that you believed, that's the degree that it will happen. In other words, how much faith we have will determine how much results we get. Alright? Isn't that kind of the way it's been taught? It has to do more with volume of faith? Okay, now, the reason that cannot be true is because, first off, Jesus never referred to any person as to volume of faith. Okay? When he said great faith, he wasn't talking like, oh man, you've got a whole bunch of faith. And then other people, he said, well, you, you know, you, you have little faith. Meaning, well, your faith is small. He wasn't referring to that. What he's referring to is not volume, but quality. Alright, there's a difference. The reason he could not be referring to volume is because he said, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, then you can speak to that mountain and it will remove itself and throw itself into the sea. Now, the reason he said mustard seed is because he said this, later on he said, this is the smallest of seeds. In other words, if you have faith the size of the smallest seed, then it will get the job done. So he could not be referring to amount of faith later because we don't need great faith. We just need faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. Right? So he was not referring to amount of faith. He was talking to a quality of faith. Now let me prove this. Let me show you from the backward church viewpoint. The Bible says, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain and it will remove itself. The church says, if you have faith the size of a mountain, you can speak to the tumor the size of a seed and it will disappear. <laughs> Isn't that right? Isn't that what we do? Because we, th How much faith have you got? Well, I don't, I don't know if I have enough faith to make this tumor go away. Well, how big is that tumor? I don't think it's as big as the Mount of Olives. Right? And until it reaches that size, Jesus said... Faith the size of a grain of mustard seed will take care of it. So why aren't we talking? See, we always talk about amount of faith. Well, good. And it always goes back to us. Because we have been schooled in having faith in our faith. Which is faith in us. Which we're never commanded in the Bible to do. We're commanded to have faith in God. Amen? With God, all things are possible. Right? Well, yeah, but you know, without God, you know, we, without Him, I can do nothing. Why do you want to emphasize, are you without him? Get saved. Why do you want to emphasize what you can do, what you can't do without him if you're not without him? Right? Do, do, do you sit in here, do you look out at your car every five minutes and go, man, if it wasn't for that car, I couldn't have got here. Yeah, I tell you, I'm so thankful for the car because if it was without it, I could, I could not have gotten here without that car. No, you don't even think about it. You go out, you get in, you drive, you come back and forth. The only time you think about your car is when it don't start. Isn't that right? Pretty much? It's about the only time you really, you know, unless you have a faith car and every time you get in, you, oh Lord, please let it start and track. Okay? I've had a few of those, okay? <laughs> but, but you understand, it's not a mount, okay? Later on, it's some, it, we, we will, remember this is kind of layer by layer, okay? We're hitting things and we'll come back around again and hit it again and come back around and overall you'll get it, okay? And then the last day we kind of tie all the pieces together and you go, ah. There you go. And so you get it. Now, but what you have to remember is several other scriptures. In Galatians it says if we, if we be not weary in well-doing, right, and not faint, then we shall reap. Isn't that right? What does that mean? It means if you keep going. Every reference to faith is never about how much because it only takes a grain. And it, isn't it funny, even in Luke, what, 17, I think it is, yeah. They said, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus doesn't say, all right, <clears throat> line up in front of me, let me put my hands on you, and I will give you, I will impart faith to you. He didn't do that. He also did not say, all right, send in your vow for $29.95 every month, and when we hit $500, then you'll have faith activated, right? He didn't do that either, right? Jesus said, and this is what struck me funny, they said, Lord, increase our faith. And he said, if you had faith, Okay, first off, they were assuming they had faith. And he's saying, you're just assuming... You... Okay, let's assume you had faith. <laughs> if you, Because he'd already told them several times before, you're faithless. He, called, every, he got on to them several different times and said, how long do I have to put up with you? Right? But he said, if you had faith, you would say 
to this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up, and cast out, and it would obey you. So faith speaks, right? Now, he used faith as, or he used a grain of mustard seed, the smallest seed, to demonstrate faith. And there, he could have said, now, if you had faith the size of this small pebble, right? And now we would be talking about pebble faith instead of grain faith, and mustard seed grain faith, right? And all those sermons on mustard seed faith and, you know, all the little things you get, the mustard seed in the packet in the mail that says, here's your mustard seed, and if you have, you know, send in your offering and it'll activate your mustard seed faith, all that kind of garbage. <clears throat> we'd, we'd be getting pebbles, you know, and which would probably be cheaper for them to find anyway. But he could have said pebble. You know why he didn't say pebble? Because pebbles don't grow. Right? Pebbles don't have life in them. Okay, a seed grows. A seed has life. Now, now understand, it's not, when I say growing, I'm not talking about it getting bigger, because a seed doesn't get bigger. A seed grows into what it's supposed to be. Right? So even mustard seed faith wouldn't be a bigger seed. It would grow into a mustard plant. Right? So what he's saying is, if your faith is going to develop... If you have faith like a seed, it will develop into what it's supposed to be, but it's going to do it by you speaking. All right? You can also see in uh, Philemon, it says um, <clears throat> that the communication of your faith may become effective by the acknowledging of every good thing in you that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, the way your faith becomes effective is by you acknowledging what you have in you from Jesus Christ. So you have to be able to speak that. If you had faith, you would speak. All right? You would speak to the problem, not to your neighbor about the problem. Right? Not to everybody else about the problem. It doesn't even say speak to God about the problem. It says speak to the problem. All right? Now, the idea... The reason he used faith is because faith has life and it, it is continual. For faith, faith is not, uh, and I'll, I'm not even going to try to get into the actual, to trying to be accurate, but in electricity, you have amps and volts. Okay? And I've had people tell me, different, I'm not an electrician, so, and if I get it wrong, tough. When you preach, you can get it right. Okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll say it both ways, and that way you can't say nothing. How's that? Okay. But I've been told this, that you have amps and volts. Volts is not generally what kills you, it's amps. I mean, it takes a, like stun guns. Stun guns can have, you know, two million volts. It ain't going to kill you. But it's got like, what, 0.25 amp or even less, something like, I mean, just a little amount of amps, right? And that the one or the other pushes the other. Yeah. Does anybody know what that is? Volts pushes amps. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Because, yeah, because it takes a whole lot to get it there and a little bit when it gets there. Okay, perfect. Good. Thank you. That makes sense. Okay. Now, when you have these, this high voltage that push the amp, the amp can be very small, but a little small amp will kill you. I mean, tiny. It doesn't take much amp at all to kill you. All right? But the purpose of electricity, voltage pushes the amp there. Now, Strong voltage is continuous, meaning it pushes, all right? Your faith as a seed will get the job done, but you must have persistence, all right? It's the persistence that pushes the seed there that gets the job done. Your faith is not what pushes it there per se. It is, John Lake said, listen, if you have to choose between faith or power, Choose faith. Because faith directs power. Alright? Faith decides where power goes. And so you have to push it there. The, the consistency is what gets it there. That's why whenever you extend your faith, you're pushing it there. That's why you've got to be consistent and persistent. If you stop, at the moment you stop, that's where your faith stops. And if you stop... Before your faith gets the job done, then you had little faith or no faith, or you could say your faith has failed. All right? 
Now, until, okay, real faith, once it decides what the Bible says it can do, and what the, what, once it decides what the Bible outcome of your situation should be, real faith doesn't stop until that situation is seen. If you stop before that situation is seen, then there, you had little faith. All right? And it, and it won't accomplish. So, true faith continues until it gets what it came for. All right? You want me to, you want me to give you an example before I send you a break? Two minutes? <laughs> Two minutes ago? All right. I'll give you one that you might not have thought about like this. Remember the woman that came to Jesus and said, Lord, my daughter, she's got a devil. And Jesus said, I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she said, yeah, that's true, you know. And he said, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. Remember, she was a woman of, Syro of uh, Canaan, right? Syrophoenicia. And now notice, he said, it's not right to give the children's bread, meaning the people of God, because she wasn't of the family of God. He said, it's not right to give the, ch the children's bread to the dogs, because you have to remember, he was sent, when he went to the Samaritans, they had a big revival. And they asked him to stay. And he could have easily been pulled into that and even been promoted as king, even by them, into Jerusalem. So he said, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, look, I'm not sent to you. I've got to get this done. I've got, got my guys. They're coming, and they will come to your house, and they will do these things. But my job is to accomplish what God sent me to do, which is to die. Right? Because he was going to Jerusalem. Now, the reason for the problem here is whenever he said, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. She didn't get mad and say, well, how dare you call me a dog? I'll tell you what. You know, she didn't get into that because if she had, her daughter would have stayed sick. Right? Or demon possessed. Instead, she subdued her own ego. And as a parent, you'll do that whenever your child is sick. And she said, well, that may be true, but... Even the dogs get the crumbs. Isn't it right? And Jesus said, For that saying, your faith has healed your daughter. Isn't it right? Now, do you realize, now think about this, all right? He even later in another gospel, he says, Woman, great is your faith. Isn't that right? Only two people he ever said had great faith Roman centurion, woman of Syrophoenicia. Both people not of the covenant. No, he never called anybody in the covenant as having great faith. You see that? Well, why? Because if you're in a covenant, it doesn't take great faith to get what belongs to you. You understand? It takes great faith whenever you're outside the covenant and you come to get it anyway. Right? That'd be like, you know, many years ago, uh, we had a guy named Ross Perot, ran for president. And, you know, billionaire. And lives down there outside of Dallas. And so, I have no connection with him, don't know him, not kin to him at all, right? But, he has a son that was building Addison Airport out there, and his son was building this big airport, needed millions of dollars. Now, if me and his son was sitting out in the waiting room, and they said, all right, Mr. Blake, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Pearl will see you now. I walked inside and I said, how, how you doing? I, uh, I'm a preacher, and you know, I need some money to preach the gospel, and, and I really think that, that you got plenty, so I, I just need a couple million dollars and we can get this thing done. Right? Now, and then he says, well, let me think about it. And so I go back out and sit down. And then he said, okay, Ross Pro Jr., come on in here. Your dad will see you now. So he goes in and says, Dad, finishing up this uh, airport out here. Need about $20 million. So, uh, you know, I, I really need to get, get that done so I can get this airport finished. Now, let me ask you, who do you think would have to have more faith to get the money? On, on whose part would it take more faith to ask for the money? Me or Ross Perot? Why? Because I ain't kin, right? I got no reason, no right, I got nothing, right? Now, so the only two people Jesus ever said had great faith were people that were not the people of God. So why do you keep trying to have great faith? You're in the family. It's his pleasure to give you. Isn't that right? Why do you keep trying to have great... In other words, what you're saying is, Daddy, I'd love to believe you, but you're such a liar. I'm trying to have faith. And I need more faith to believe you. Because you, you just lie all the time. I just can't believe a word you say. That's what you're saying. You understand? 
Now, once he said that, do you realize that... Now think about this. Jesus was the voice of God on the earth. Isn't that right? Nobody else was speaking for God technically at that point. Whatever Jesus said, God said, right? So Jesus slash God told that woman, no. Isn't that right? He told her no. She said, I need you to get my daughter. He said, nope. Isn't that right? He said no. God said no. Now let me ask you, did the girl get healed? So wait a minute. God said no, but the girl got healed. Right? So maybe great faith is not taking no for an answer even when God says it. Now think about that. Now, the beauty of this is, and before you get scared, <clears throat> okay, God can't say no anymore. Right? All the promises are in Him, yea, means yes, and in Him, amen, or so be it. So He cannot say no. Do you understand? You ask for healing, healing is a promise. It's, well, it goes beyond that, but anyway, we'll get into that later. <clears throat> but if you, whatever you ask for that's covered by the Bible, the answer is already yes. Right? So if faith can get an answer even when God says no, don't you think that faith can get an answer when God's already said yes? See how hard we've made it? And it's not hard at all. The bad part is, is that we have built up strongholds through wrong teaching that cause us to short-circuit our own selves in even asking. Amen? Take a break. Okay, break's over. Let's get started. Yeah. <laughs>